The following is a conversation with Tommaso Poggio. He's the professor at MIT and is a director of the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Cited over 100,000 times, his work has had a profound impact on our understanding of the nature of intelligence in both biological and artificial neural networks. He has been an advisor to many highly impactful researchers and entrepreneurs in AI, including Demis Hassabis of DeepMind, Amnon Shashwa of Mobileye, and Christoph Koch of the Allen Institute for Brain Science. This conversation is part of the MIT course on artificial general intelligence and the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D. And now, here's my conversation with Tommaso Poggio. You've mentioned that in your childhood, you've developed a fascination with physics, especially the theory of relativity, and that Einstein was also a childhood hero to you. What aspect of Einstein's genius, the nature of his genius, do you think was essential for discovering the theory of relativity? You know, Einstein was a, a hero to me and I'm sure to many people because he was able to make, uh, uh, of course, a major, major contribution to physics with simplifying a bit just a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. You know, imagining uh, communication with lights between a stationary observer and somebody on a train. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that just with the force of, of his thought, of his thinking, of his mind, he could get to some something so deep in terms of physical reality, how time depends on space and speed. It was something absolutely fascinating. It was the power of intelligence, the power of the mind. Do you think the ability to imagine, to visualize as he did, as a lot of great physicists do, do you think that's in all of us human beings, or is there something special to that one particular human being? I think, uh, you know, all, all of us can learn and have a uh, in principle, similar br breakthroughs. Uh, there are lessons to be learned from Einstein. Uh, he was one of five PhD students at ETA, uh, the Eidgenossische Technische Hochschule in uh, Zurich in physics. And he was the worst of the five. The only <laughs> one who did not get an academic position when uh, he graduated when he finished his PhD and he went to work, as everybody knows, for the patent office. And so it's not so much that he worked for the patent office, but the fact that obviously he was smart, but he was not a top student, obviously he was the anti-conformist. He was not thinking in the traditional way that probably his teachers and the other students were doing. So there is a lot to be said about, uh, you know, trying to be to do the opposite or something quite different from what other people are doing. That's certainly true for the stock market. Never <laughs> never buy if everybody's buying it. <laughs> and also true for science. Yes. So you've also mentioned, staying on the theme of physics, that you were excited at a young age by the mysteries of the universe that uh, physics could uncover. Such, as I saw mentioned, the possibility of time travel. <laughs> so the most out-of-the-box question I think I'll get to ask today, do you think time travel is possible? Well, it would be nice if it were possible right now. Uh, you know, in, in science, you never say no. Um, but your understanding of the nature of time. Yeah, it's very likely that it's not possible to travel in time. Um, we may be able to travel forward in time, if we can, for instance, freeze ourselves or, uh, you know, go on some spacecraft traveling close to the speed of light. But in terms of actively traveling, for instance, back in time, I find probably very unlikely. So do you still hold the, the underlying dream of the engineering intelligence that we will build systems that are able to do such huge leaps, like discovering 
the kind of mechanism that would be required to travel through time. Do you still hold that dream or is, or echoes of it from your childhood? Yeah. I, you know, I don't think whether uh, there are certain problems that probably cannot be solved depending what, uh, what you believe about the physical reality. Like, uh, you know, maybe totally impossible to create energy from nothing or to travel back in time, but uh, um, about uh, making machines that can uh, think as well as we do or better, or more likely, especially in the short and mid term, help us think better, which is in a sense is happening already with the computers we have, and it will happen more and more. Well, that I certainly believe, and I don't see in principle why computers at some point could not become more intelligent than we are, although the word intelligence is a tricky one and one who should discuss <laughs> what sure. I mean with that. <laughs> uh, in, intelligence, consciousness, yeah. words like love, is all these are very, uh, yeah. you need to be disentangled. So you've mentioned also that you believe the problem of intelligence is the greatest problem in science, greater than the origin of life and the origin of the universe. You've also, uh, in the talk I've listened to, uh, said that you're open to arguments against, uh, against you. So uh, what do you think is the most captivating aspect of this problem of understanding the nature of intelligence? Why does it captivate you as it does? Well, originally, I think one of the motivation that I had as, a, I guess, a teenager when I was infatuated with theory of relativity was really that I, I found that there was uh, the problem of time and space and general relativity, but there were so many other problems of the same level of difficulty and importance that I could, uh, even if I were Einstein, it was difficult to hope to solve all of them. So... What about solving a problem or solution and allow me to solve all the problems? And this was, what if we could find the key to an intelligence, you know, 10 times better or faster than Einstein? So that's sort of seeing artificial intelligence as a, as a tool to expand our capabilities. But is there just an inherent curiosity in you in just understanding what it is in our in, in here that makes it all all work? Yes, absolutely, you are right. So I was starting. I started saying this was the motivation when I was a teenager, right. but uh, you know, soon after, uh, I think the problem of human intelligence became a, a real focus of you know of, of my of my science and my research because I think he's for me the most interesting problem is really asking uh, who we, we are, right? Is asking not only a question about science, but even about the very tool we are using to do science, which is our brain. How does our brain work? From where does it come from? What are its limitations? Can we make it better? And that in many ways is the ultimate question that underlies this whole effort of science. So you've made significant contributions in both the science of intelligence and the engineering of intelligence. In a hypothetical way, let me ask, how far do you think we can get in creating intelligence systems without understanding the biological, the understanding how the human brain creates intelligence? Put another way, do you think we can build a strong AI system without really uh, getting at the core, the functional nature, understanding the functional nature of the brain? Well, this is a, a real difficult question. You know, we did uh, um, solve problems like flying without uh, really using too much our knowledge about how birds fly. It was important, I guess, to know that you could have uh, things heavier than than air being able to fly like uh, like birds 
but beyond that, probably we did not learn very much. You know, some. You know, the, the brothers Wright did learn a lot of observation about birds and, and designing their their aircraft. But uh, you know, you can argue we did not use much of biology in that particular case. Now, in the case of intelligence, I think that um, it's it's a bit of a bet right now. If you are if you ask, uh, okay, um, we we all agree we'll get at some point, maybe soon, maybe later, to a machine that is indistinguishable from my secretary, say in terms of what I can ask the machine to do. I think we'll get there. And now the question is, and you can ask people, do you think we'll get there without any knowledge about, uh, you know, the human brain or that the best way to get there is to understand better the human brain? Yeah. Okay, this is, I think, an educated bet that different people with different background will decide in different ways. The recent history of the progress in AI in the last uh, I would say five years or 10 years is, has been the, the main uh, breakthroughs, the main recent breakthroughs are really start from neuroscience. I can mention reinforcement learning as one, is one of the algorithms at the core of AlphaGo, which is the system that beat the kind of an official world champion of Go Lee Sidol and two, three years ago in uh, Seoul. Um, that's one, and that started really with the work of Pavlov, um, <laughs> 1900, <laughs> Marvin Minsky in the 60s, and many ne other neuroscientists later on. Um, and deep learning uh, started uh, which is at the core again of AlphaGo and systems like uh, autonomous uh, driving systems for cars, like the systems that uh, Mobileye, which is a company started by one of my ex postdoc, Amnon Shashua. Yes. Um, they, they, so th that is at the core of those things. And deep learning, r really, the initial ideas in terms of the architecture of these layered hierarchical networks started with work of. Thorsten Wiesel and David Hubel at Harvard up mm -hmm. the river in the 60s. So recent history suggests that neuroscience played a big role in these breakthroughs. My personal bet is that there is a good chance they continue to play a big role, maybe not in all the future breakthroughs, but in some of them. At least in inspiration. So y At least in an inspiration, absolutely, yes. So, so you studied both uh, artificial and biological neural networks. You said these uh, mechanisms that underlie deep learning deep uh, and reinforcement learning. But there is nevertheless uh, significant differences between biological and artificial neural networks as they stand now. So between the two, w what do you find is the most interesting, mysterious, maybe even beautiful difference as, as it currently stands in our understanding? I must confess that until recently, I found that the artificial networks too simplistic relative to real neural networks. But, uh, you know, recently I've been started to think that, yes, there are a very big simplification of what you find in the brain. But on the other hand, they are, are much closer in terms of the architecture to the brain than other models that we had uh, that computer science used f as model of thinking, which were mathematical logics, you know, Lisp, Prolog, <laughs> and those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. So in comparison to those, they're much closer to the brain. You have networks of neurons, which is what the brain is about. And the, the artificial neurons in the models are, as I said, caricature of the biological neurons, but they're still neurons, single units communicating with other units, something that is absent in, uh, you know, the traditional uh, computer type uh, models of mathematics, uh, reasoning, uh, and so on. So what aspect do you th would you like to see in artificial neural networks 
added over time as we try to figure out ways to improve them. So one of uh, the main differences and uh, you know problems in terms of deep learning today, and it's not only deep learning, and the brain is the need for deep learning techniques to have uh, a lot of labeled examples. You know, for instance, for ImageNet, you have like a training set, which is one million images, each one labeled by some human mm -hmm. in terms of which object is there. And um, it's, it's clear that in biology, a baby may be able to see million of images in the first years of life, but will not have million of labels given to him or her by parents or take, take uh, caretakers. So uh, how do you solve that? You know, I think uh, there is this interesting challenge that today uh, deep learning and related techniques are all about big data, big data meaning a lot of examples labeled by humans. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas in uh, nature you have, uh, so that this big data is N going to infinity, that's the best, you know, N meaning label data. Mm -hmm. But I think the biological world is more N going to one. <laughs> a, a child can learn- It's a beautiful way to put it. Very small number of, you know, labeled examples. Like you tell a child, this is a car, you don't need to say, like in ImageNet, you know, this is a car, this is a car, this is not a car, this is not a car, one, one million times. <laughs> so, and of course with AlphaGo, and, or at least the yeah. AlphaZero variants, there's, because of, the, because of the world of Go is so simplistic that you can actually learn by yourself through self-play, you can play against each other. Yeah. And the real world, I mean, the visual system that you've studied extensively is a lot more complicated than the game of Go. So right. I, on the comment about children, which are fascinatingly good at learning new stuff, how much of it do you think is hardware and how much of it is software? Yeah, that's a, a good, a deep question. Is In a sense, is the old question of nurture and nature, yeah. how much is in the gene and how much is in the experience of an individual. Obviously, it's both that play a role. And... Uh, I believe that the way evolution gives, put prior information, so to speak, hardwired, is not really hardwired, but um, uh, that's essentially an hypothesis. I think what's going on is that evolution has, um, you know, almost necessarily, if you believe in Darwin, is very opportunistic. and and think about uh, uh, our DNA and the DNA of Drosophila. Mm -hmm. uh, our DNA does not have many more genes than Drosophila. Oh, no. The fly. The fly, yeah. the fruit fly. Yeah. Now, we know that the fruit fly does not learn very much during its individual existence. It looks like one of this machinery that it's really mostly, not 100%, but you know, 95% hard-coded by the genes. But since we don't have many more genes than Drosophila, as evolution could encode in us a kind of general learning machinery, and then had to give very weak priors, mm -hmm. um, like for instance, let me take, give a, a specific example, which is recent to work by a member of our Center for Brains, Minds and Machines. We know because of work of other people in our group and other groups that there are cells in a part of our brain, neurons, mm -hmm. that are tuned to faces. They seem to be involved in face recognition. Now this face area, exist, uh, uh, seems to be present in young uh, children and adults. Um, and one question is, is there from the beginning, is hardwired by evolution, or you know, somehow is learned very quickly. 
So what's your, by the way, a lot of the questions I'm asking, we, the answer is we don't really know. But as a person who has contributed some profound ideas in these fields, you're a good person to guess at some of these. So, of course, there's a caveat before a lot of the stuff we talk about. But what is your hunch? Is the face, the part of the brain that, that seems to be concentrated on face recognition, are you born with that or are you just is designed to, to learn that quickly, like the face of the mother? Right. And so my, my hunch, you know, my bias was the second one, learned very quickly. And uh, it turns out that Marge Livingstone at Harvard has done some uh, amazing experiments in which she raised baby monkeys, depriving them of faces during the first weeks of life. So they see technicians but the technician have a mask. Yes. And um, and so when they looked uh, um, at uh, the area in the brain of these monkeys that were usually you, you find faces, they found no face preference. So my guess is that what evolution does in this case is there is a plastic, an area which is plastic, which is kind of predetermined to be imprinted very easily. But the command from the gene is not a detailed circuitry for a face template. Could be, but this will require probably a lot of bits. Mm -hmm. You have to specify a lot of connection of a lot of neurons. Instead, the, com the command from the gene is something like imprint, memorize, what you see most often in the first two weeks of life, especially in connection with food, and maybe nipples, I don't know. Right, <laughs> well, source of food. And yeah. so in the, that area is very plastic at first and then yeah. solidifies. It'd be interesting if a variant of that experiment would show a different kind of pattern associated with food than a face pattern, well, whether that could right. stick. There are indications that during that experiment, what well, the monkey saw quite often were um, the blue gloves of the technicians that were giving to the baby monkeys the milk. Mm -hmm. And some of the cells, in, instead of being face sensitive in that area, are hand sensitive. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Yep. Can you uh, talk about what are the different parts of the brain and in your view sort of loosely and how do they contribute to intelligence? Do, do you see the brain as a bunch of different modules and they together come in the human brain to create intelligence or is it all one uh, mush of the same kind of fundamental <laughs> uh, um, the, right. the, uh, architecture? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, an important question and uh, there was a phase in, uh, neuroscience back in the 1950 or so, in which uh, it was believed for a while that the brain was equipotential, this was the term. You could cut out a piece and um, nothing special happened apart a little bit less performance. There was a, a surgeon, Lashley, who did a lot of experiments of this type with mice and rats and concluded that every part of the brain was essentially equivalent to any other one. It turns out that that's, that's really not true. It's, uh, there are very specific modules in the brain, as you said, mm -hmm. and uh, you know people may lose the ability to speak if you have a stroke in a certain region or may lose control of their legs in another region or so they're very specific the brain is also quite flexible and redundant so often it can correct things and uh, you know the kind of um, um, take over functions from one uh, part of the brain to the other but uh, but but really there are specific modules so the answer that we know from this old work, uh, which was basically on based on lesions, mm. either on animals or very often there were a um, mine of, um, well, they, there was a mine of very interesting data coming from 
um, from the war, from different types of um, injuries. injuries that soldiers had in the brain. And uh, more recently, um, functional MRI, which allow you to, to check which part of the brain are active when you are doing different tasks, as you know, re re can replace some of this. You can see that certain parts of the brain are involved, are active in Vision, certain Vision, language, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. But sort of taking a step back to that part of the brain that discovers, that uh, specializes in the face and how that might be learned, what's your intuition behind, you know, is it possible that the sort of from a physicist's perspective, when you get lower and lower, that it's all the same stuff and it just, when you're born, it's plastic and, and it quickly figures out this part is going to be about vision, this is going to be about language, this is about common sense reasoning. Do you have an intuition that that kind of learning is going on really quickly or is it really kind of solidified in hardware? That's a great question. Uh, so there are parts of the brain like the cerebellum or the hippocampus that are quite different from each other. They clearly have different anatomy, different connectivity. They're, then there is uh, the, the cortex, which is the, the most developed part of the brain in humans. And in the cortex, you have different regions of the cortex that are responsible for vision, for audition, for motor control, for language. Now, one of the big puzzles of, of this is that in the, the cortex, is the cortex, is the cortex, is, is, looks like it is the same in terms of um, hardware, in mm -hmm. terms of type of neurons and connectivity across these different modalities. So for the cortex, letting aside these other parts of the brain, like spinal cord, hippocampus, cerebellum, and so on. For the cortex, I think your question about hardware and software and learning and so on, it's, it's, I think is rather open. And, uh, you know, it, I find very interesting for us to think about an architecture, computer architecture that is good for vision and at the same time is good for language. Seems to be, you know, so different problem uh, areas that you have to solve. But the underlying mechanism might be the same, and that's really instructive for it may be, artificial neural networks. Right. So you've done a lot of great work in vision, in human vision, computer vision, and you mentioned the problem of human vision as really as difficult as the problem of general intelligence. And maybe that connects to the cortex discussion. Uh, can you describe the human visual cortex and how the humans begin to understand the world uh, through the raw sensory information? Uh, what's, uh, for folks enough familiar, <laughs> especially in on the computer vision side, we don't often actually take a step back except saying with a sentence or two that one is inspired by the other. What, what, what is it that we know about the human visual cortex? That's interesting. So we know quite a bit. At the same time, we don't know a lot. But the, <laughs> the, the bit we know, you know, in a, in a sense, we know a lot of the details and um, and men we don't know, and uh, we know a lot of the top level, um, the answer to the top level question, but uh, we don't know some basic ones, even in terms of general neuroscience, forgetting vision. You know, why do we sleep? It's right. <laughs> such a basic question, and we really don't have an answer to that. Do you so, think, so taking a step back yeah. on that, so sleep, for example, is fascinating. Do you think that's a neuroscience question? Or if we talk about abstractions, what do you think is an interesting way to study intelligence or most effective on the levels of abstraction? Is it chemical, is it biological, is it electrophysical, mathematical, as you've done a lot of excellent work on that side? Which psychology, sort of like, at which level of abstraction do you think? Well, in terms of levels of um, abstraction, I think we need all of them. All of it's them. when, uh, you know, it's like uh, if you ask me 
what does it mean to understand a computer, right? And, and that's much simpler. But in a computer, I could say, well, I understand how to use PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. That's my level of understanding a computer. It's it is reasonable, you know. It gives me some power to produce slides and beautiful slides. And now, you can ask somebody else. He says, "Well, I I know how the transistor work that are inside the computer. I can write the equation for, you know, transistor and diodes and circuits, uh, logical circuits." And I can ask this guy, "Do you know how to operate PowerPoint?" No idea. Right? <laughs> so, do you think if we discovered computers? walking amongst us full of these transistors that are also uh, operating under windows and have PowerPoint. Do you think it's digging in a little bit more? How useful is it to understand the transistor in order to be able to understand PowerPoint and these higher level Very good. intelligent yes. processes? So I think in the case of computers, because they were made by engineers, by us, mm -hmm this different level of understanding are rather separate on purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, you, they are separate modules so that the engineer that designed the circuit for the chips does not need to know what uh, is inside PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And somebody you can write to the, the software translating from one to the, un, uh, to the other. And so um, in that case, I don't think, uh, uh, understanding the transistor help you understand PowerPoint or very little. Right. Um, if you want to understand the computer, this question, you know, I would say you have to understand it at different levels. If you really yep. want to to build it one, right? But uh, but for the brain, I think these levels of understanding, so the algorithms, which kind of computation, you know, the equivalent of PowerPoint, and the circuits, you know, the transistors, I think they are mo much more intertwined with each other. There is not, you know, a neatly uh, level of the software separate from the hardware. And so that's wh why I think in the case of the brain, the problem is more difficult and more than for computers requires the interaction, the collaboration between different types of expertise. So it's a big, the brain is a big hierarchical mess that so you can't just un disentangle uh, uh, I levels. I think you can, but it's, it's much more difficult and it's not, uh, you know, it's not completely obvious. And as I said, I think it's one of the, personally I think is the greatest problem in science. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I think it's, it's fair that it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> That's a difficult one. That said, you do talk about compositionality and mm -hmm. why it might be useful. And when you discuss what, why these neural networks in artificial or biological sense learn anything, you talk about uh, compositionality. Yeah. See, there's a sense that nature can be disentangled or, uh, well, all aspects of our cognition could be disentangled a little mm -hmm. to some degree. So why do you think, what, first of all, how do you see compositionality and why do you think it exists at all in nature? I spoke about, uh, I use the, the term compositionality when we looked at deep neural networks, multi-layers, and trying to understand when and why they are more powerful than uh, uh, more classical one-layer networks like linear classifier or kernel machines, so-called. Um, and what we found is that in terms of approximating or learning or representing a function, a, a mapping from an input to an output, like from an image to the label in the image, um, if this function has a particular structure, mm -hmm. then deep networks are much more powerful than shallow networks to approximate the underlying function. And the particular structure is a structure of compositionality. If the function is made up of functions of functions, so that you need to look on, when you are interpreting an image, classifying an image, you don't need to look at all pixels at once, but you can compute 
something from uh, small groups of pixels and then you can compute something on the output of this local computation and so on. So Which is similar to what you do when you read a sentence. You don't need to read the first and the last letter, but you can read syllables, combine them in words, combine the words in sentences. So this is this kind of structure. So that's as part of a discussion of why deep neural networks may be more effective than the shallow methods. Yeah. And is your sense for most things we can use neural networks for, th those problems are going to be compositional in nature, like, uh, like language, like vision. How far can we get in this kind of right. way? So here is almost philosophy. Well, let's you go know, there. <laughs> yeah, let's go there. So a friend of mine, Max Tegmark, who is a physicist at MIT. I've talked to him on this thing. Yeah, and he disagrees with you, right? A yeah, little bit. We, you know, we agree on mo most, but the conclusion is a bit different. He, he, his conclusion is that for images, for instance, the compositional structure of this function that we have to learn or to solve these problems comes from physics, comes from the fact that you have local interactions in physics between atoms and other atoms, between particle of matter and other particles, between planets and other planets, between stars and other, it's all local. Yeah. Um, and that's true, um, but you could push this argument a bit further, um, not this argument actually, you could argue that, um, you know, maybe that's part of the truth, but maybe what happens is kind of the opposite is that our brain is wired up as a deep network. Mm -hmm. So it can learn, understand, solve, problems that have this compositional structure mm -hmm. and cannot do, they cannot solve problems that don't have this compositional structure. Mm -hmm. So the problems we are accustomed to, we think about, we test our algorithms on, are this compositional structure because our brain is made up. And that's in a sense, an evolutionary perspective yes. that we've, so the the ones that didn't have uh that, that weren't dealing with a compositional nature of reality uh died off. Yes, but also could be maybe the reason why we have this uh, local connectivity in the brain, like uh, simple cells in cortex looking only at the small part of the image, each one of them, and then other cells looking at the small number of these simple cells and so on. The reason for this may be purely that it was difficult to grow long range connectivity. Mm. So suppose it's, you know, for biology, it's possible to grow short range connectivity, but not long range also because there is a limited Yes. number of long range that you can. And so you have a, this, this limitation from the biology. And this means you build a deep convolutional network. This would be something like a deep convolutional network. And this is fa great for solving certain class of problems. These are the ones we are, we find easy and important for our life. And yes, they were enough for us to survive. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and you can start a successful business on solving those problems, uh, right? Uh, like yeah. with Mobileye, uh, driving is, is, is a compositional problem. Right. So on the, on the learning task, I mean, we don't know much about how the brain learns in terms of optimization, but uh, so the thing that's stochastic gradient descent is what artificial neural networks use for the most part to uh, adjust the parameters in such a way that it's able to deal, uh, based on the label data, it's able to solve the problem. Yeah. So what's your intuition about uh, why it works at all, how hard of a problem it is 
to optimize a neural network, uh, artificial neural network? Is there other alternatives? Yeah, just in general, your intuition is behind this very simplistic algorithm that seems to do pretty good, surprisingly. Yes, so. It's, it's, yes. So I find um, neuroscience, the, the architecture of uh, cortex, is really similar to the architecture of deep networks. So th there is a nice correspondence there between the biology and this kind of local connectivity, hierarchical um, architecture. The stochastic gradient descent, as you said, is, um, is a very simple technique. It seems pretty unlikely that biology could do that from from what we know right now about you know cortex and neurons and synapses um, so it's a big question open whether there are other optimization learning algorithms that can replace stochastic gradient descent and uh, my my guess is yes but nobody has found yet a real answer. I mean, people are trying, still trying, and there are some interesting ideas. The fact that um, stochastic gradient descent is so successful, this has become clear is not so mysterious. And the reason is that um, it's an interesting fact, that, you know, it's a change in a sense in uh, how people think about statistics. <laughs> and and this is the following, is that typically when you had uh, data and you had, say, a model with parameters, you are trying to fit the model to the data, you know, to fit the parameter. Typically, the kind of, um, kind of uh, crowd wisdom uh, type idea was you should, have at least uh, you know twice the number of data than the number of parameters you have. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe 10 times is better now the way you train neural network these days is that they have they have 10 or 100 times more parameters than data exactly the opposite and which you know it is it has been one of the puzzles about the neural networks how can you get something that really works when you have so much freedom in uh, you know. from that little data you can generalize yeah. somehow right exactly do you think this the stochastic nature of it is essential the randomness so i think we have some initial understanding why this happens but um one nice side effect of having this over parameterization more parameters than data is that when you look for the minima of a loss function like stochastic gradient descent is doing, um, you find, I, I, I made some calculations based on some old uh, basic theorem of algebra called the Bezout theorem, and that gives you an, a, an estimate of the number of solution of a system of polynomial equation. Anyway, the bottom line is that there are probably more minima for a typical deep networks uh, than atoms in the universe. Just to say there are a lot <laughs> because of the overparameterization. Yes. A more global minimum, zero minimum, good minimum. So it's not more too- More global minima. Yeah, wow, a lot okay. of them. So you have a lot of solutions. So it's not yeah. so surprising that you can find them relatively easily. And this oh, is I this see. is because yeah. of the overparameterization. The overparameterization sprinkles that entire space with solutions that yes. are pretty good. Yeah, and so it's you, not so surprising, right? It's like, you know, if you have a system of linear equation and you have more unknowns than equations, then you have we know you have an infinite number of solutions, and uh, the question is to pick one. That's another story. But you have an infinite number of solutions, so there are a lot of of value of your unknowns that satisfy the equations. But it's possible that there's a lot of those solutions that aren't very good. Well, what's surprising right. is that so they're pretty good. So that's a separate question. Why can you pick one that generalizes well? Yeah, But exactly. that's a separate question with separate answers, yeah. One, one uh, theorem that 
people like to talk about that kind of inspires imagination of the power of neural networks is the universality, uh, universal approximation theorem, that you can approximate any computable function with just a finite number of neurons in a single hidden layer. Do you, do you find this theorem, one, surprising? Do you find it useful, interesting, inspiring? No, they, this one, uh, you know, I never found it very surprising. It uh, was known since the 80s, mm -hmm. since I entered the field, because it's basically the same as Weierstrass theorem, which says that I can approximate any continuous function with a polynomial of sufficiently, with a sufficient number of terms, monomials. Yeah. It's so basically the same, and the proofs are very similar. So your intuition was there was never any doubt that neural yeah. networks, in theory, could, right. could be very strong approximations. Right. The, the, the question, the interesting question is that if this theorem uh, says you can approximate, fine, but when you ask how many neurons, for instance, or in the case of polynomial, how many monomials, I need to get a good approximation. Then it turns out that that depends on the dimensionality of your function, how many variables you have. But it depends on the dimensionality of your function in a bad way. It's, for instance, suppose you want an error which is uh, no worse than 10% in your approximation. You come up with a network that approximates your function within 10%. Then it turns out that the number of units you need are in the order of 10 to the dimensionality, d, mm -hmm. how many variables. So if you have, you know, two variables is d is two, and you have 100 units, and okay. But if you have, say, 200 by 200 pixel images, now this is you know, 40,000, whatever. And we again that, go to the size of the universe pretty quickly. Yeah, exactly, 10 to the 40,000 or something. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so uh, this is called the curse of dimensionality. Yeah. Not, you know, quite appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> and the hope is with the extra layers, you can uh, uh, remove the curse. What we proved is that if you have uh, deep layers or hierarchical architecture of the, with the local connectivity of the type of convolutional deep learning. And if you're dealing with a function that has this kind of uh, hierarchical architecture, then you avoid completely the curse. <laughs> You've spoken a lot about supervised deep learning. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts, hopes, views on the challenges of unsupervised learning? With the with GANs, with uh, generative adversarial networks, do you see those as distinct? the The power of GANs, do you see those as distinct from the supervised methods in neural networks, or are they really all in the same representation ballpark? GANs is uh, one way to get um, estimation of uh, uh, probability densities, which is a somewhat new way that people have not done before. I I don't know whether um, this will really play an important role in, uh, you know, in intelligence or, um, it's it's interesting. I'm, I'm less enthusiastic about it than many people in the field. Yeah. I have the feeling that many people in the field are um, really impressed by the ability to, of producing realistic looking images in a, in this generative way. Which describes the popularity of the methods, but you're saying that while that's exciting and cool to look at, it may not be the tool that's useful for. Yeah. For So you describe it kind of beautifully. Uh, current supervised methods go N to infinity in terms of number of labeled points, and we really have to figure out how to go to N to one. Yeah. And you're thinking GANs might help, but they might not be the I, right. I don't think in for that problem, which I really think is important. I think they may help. Uh, they certainly have applications, for instance, in computer graphics. And right. you know, we I did work long ago, which was a little bit similar in terms of uh, saying, okay, I have a, a network, and 
I present images and uh, I can, uh, um, so input its images and output is, for instance, the pose of the image. Mm -hmm. You know, a face, how much is smiling, is rotated 45 degrees or not. Mm -hmm. uh, what about having a network that I train with the same data set, but now I invert input and output. Now the input is the pose or the expression, a number, set of numbers, and the output is the image, and I train it. And we did pretty good, interesting results in terms of producing very realistic looking images. It was, um, you know, a more, less sophisticated mechanism, but the uh, output was pretty, uh, less than GANs, but the output was pretty much of the same quality. So I think for a computer graphics type application, yeah, for, definitely GANs can be quite useful, and not only for that, for, but um, for, uh, you know, helping, for instance, uh, on this problem of unsupervised example of reducing the number of labeled examples, um, I think people, uh, it's like they think they can get out more than they put in. You know, it, it's <laughs> there's no free lunches. Yeah, said. right. Uh, so what do you think, what's your intuition? Um, how can we slow the growth of N to infinity and supervise oh. uh, N to infinity oh. and supervise learning? So, for example, uh, Mobileye uh, has very successfully, I mean, essentially annotated large amounts of data to be able to drive a car. Now, one, one thought is, so we're trying to teach machines, school yep. of AI, and we're trying to, so how can we become better teachers maybe? That's one one way. No, you are, you, are, you know, <laughs> what I, I like that because one, uh, um, again, one caricature of uh, the history of computer science, you could say, is, is it begins with programmers, mm -hmm. expensive. Yep. Continue with labelers, cheap. Yep. And the future will be schools, like we have for kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, the labeling methods, we're not selective about which examples we we teach networks with. So, so I think the focus of making one shot, networks that learn much faster is often on the architecture side, but how can we pick better examples with which to learn? Uh, do you have yeah. intuitions about that? Well, that's part of the, que uh, the part of the problem, but the other one is, um, you know, if we look at um, biology, um, a reasonable assumption, I think, is um, in the same spirit that I said, evolution is opportunistic and has weak priors, you know, the way I, I, I think uh, the intelligence of a child, the baby may develop is um, by bootstrapping mm. weak priors from evolution. For instance, um, in uh, you can assume that you have in most organisms, including human babies, built in some basic uh, machinery to uh, detect motion and relative motion. S and in fact, there is, you know, we know all insects from fruit flies to other animals, they have this. Uh, even in the retina, so in the very peripheral part, of it. it's very conserved across species, something that evolution discovered early. It may be the reason why babies tend to look in the first few days to moving objects and not to not moving objects. Now, moving objects means, okay, they're attracted by motion, but motion also means that motion gives automatic segmentation from the background. Mm. So because of motion boundaries, you know, either the object is moving mm -hmm. or the eye of the baby is tracking the moving object and the background is moving, right? Yeah, so just on, purely on the visual characteristics of the scene, that seems to be the most useful. Right, so it's like looking at an, at an, an, ob an object without background. without background. It's ideal for learning the object, otherwise it's really difficult. 
because you have so much stuff. So suppose you do this at the beginning, first uh, weeks. Then after that, you can recognize objects. Now they are imprinted, a number of them. Even in the background, even without motion. So that's at the, by the way, I just want to ask on the object recognition problem. So there is this being responsive to movement and doing edge detection, essentially. What's the gap between being effectively effective at visually recognizing stuff, detecting where it is, and understanding the scene? Is this a huge gap in many layers, or is it, are we, is it close? No, I think that's a huge gap. I think uh, present algorithm with all the success that we have and the fact that there are a lot of very useful, it's, I think we are, we are in a golden age for applications of um, low level vision and low level speech recognition and so on, you know, Alexa and so on. Um, there are many more things of similar level to be done, including medical diagnosis and so on, but we are far from what we call understanding of a scene, of language, of actions, of people. Uh, that is, despite the claims, uh, that's, I think, are very far. We're a little bit off. So in popular culture and among many researchers, some of which I've spoken with, the Stuart Russell and Elon Musk, uh, in and out of the AI field, uh, there's a concern about the existential threat of AI. Yeah. And how do you think about this concern? In the, and is it valuable to think about large scale, long term, unintended consequences of intelligent systems we try to build? I always think it's better to worry first, you know, early rather than late. <laughs> <laughs> so, so worry not, is good. Yeah, yeah. I'm not against worrying at all. Yeah. Uh, personally, I think that um, uh, you know it will take a long time before there is real reason to be worried. But as I said, I think it's, it's good to put in place and think about possible safety against. Uh, uh, what I find a bit misleading are things like um, that have been said by people I know, like Elon Musk and uh, what is Bostrom in particular, yeah, yeah. And what is his first name? Uh, Nick Bostrom. Nick Bostrom, right. Um, you know, and a couple of other people that, for instance, um, AI is more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Right. Yeah, I think that's really wrong. <laughs> that can be, it's misleading, right, because it, in terms of priority, we should still be more worried about nuclear weapons and uh, you know what people are doing about it and so on than AI. And uh, you've st spoken about Demis Hassabis and yourself saying uh, that you think it'll be about 100 years out before we have a general intelligence system that's on par with a human being. Do you have any updates for those predictions? Well, I think he said... He said he, 20, I think. He, he said, said 20, right. This was a couple of years ago. I have not asked him again, so I should have. Your own prediction. What's your prediction about when you'll be truly surprised? Uh, and what's the confidence interval on that? <laughs> I, you know, it's so difficult to predict the future and even the present sometimes. It's, it's pretty hard to predict, <laughs> Right, yeah. but I would be, but as I said, I, this is completely, it's, is I would be more like um, uh, Rod Brooks. Mm -hmm. I think he's about <laughs> 200 years. 200 <laughs> years. <laughs> when we have this kind of AGI system, artificial general intelligence system, and we, you're sitting in a room with uh, her, him, it, do you think it will be uh, the underlying design of such a system is something we'll be able to understand? It will be simple. Do you think it'll be explainable, uh, understandable by us? Your intuition, again, we're in the realm of philosophy a little bit. Well, probably no, but it, it again, it depends what you really mean for understanding. So. I think, 
you know, we don't uh, understand uh, what how deep networks work. I think we are beginning to have a theory now. Mm-hmm. But in the case of deep networks, or even in the case of the simple, simpler kernel machines or linear classifier, we really don't understand the individual units right. or so. We, but we understand, you know, what the computation and the limitations and the properties of it are. Uh, it's similar to many things, you know, we, what does it mean to understand how a fusion bomb works? How many of us, you know, many of us understand the basic principle and some of us may understand deeper details. In that sense, understanding is as a community, as a civilization, can we build another copy of it? Okay. And in that sense, do you think there'll be there'll need to be some evolutionary component where it runs away from our understanding? Or do you think it could be engineered from the ground up? The same way you go from the transistor to right. PowerPoint. All right. So Many years ago, this was actually, let me see, 40, 41 years ago, I wrote a paper with uh, David Marr, who was um, one of the founding fathers of computer vision, computational vision. I wrote a paper about uh, levels of understanding, which is related to the question I discussed earlier about uh, understanding PowerPoint, understanding transistors, and so on. And... Uh, uh, you know, in that kind of fr- framework, we had the level of the hardware mm-hmm. and the top level of the algorithms. We did not have learning. Recently, I updated adding levels, and one level I added to those three was learning. So, and you can imagine you could have a good understanding of how you construct a learning machine, like we do but being unable to describe in detail what the learning machines will discover, mm-hmm. right? Now, that would be still a powerful understanding if I can build a learning machine, even if I don't understand in detail every time it, it learns something. Just like our children, if they if they start listening to a certain type of music, I don't know, Miley Cyrus or something, you don't understand why they came yeah. to that particular preference, but you understand the learning process. That's right. very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, on learning for systems to be part of our world, it has a certain, one of the challenging things that you've spoken about is learning ethics, learning yeah. morals, and what, how hard do you think is the problem of, first of all, humans understanding our ethics? What is the origin on the neural on the low level of ethics? What is it at the higher level? Is it something that's learnable from machines and your intuition? I think, uh, yeah, ethics is learnable, very likely. Um, I, I think I, it's one of these problems where I think understanding the neuroscience of ethics, you know, people discuss there is an ethics of neuroscience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. You know, how a neuroscientist should or should not behave. Uh, I can <laughs> yeah. think of a neurosurgeon uh, and the ethics uh, rule he has to be or he, she has to be. But I'm more interested on the on the, <laughs> the neuroscience of you're blowing ethics. my mind right now the neuroscience of ethics it's very meta yeah and uh, you know i think that would be important to understand also for being able to to design machines that have that are ethical machines in our sense of ethics and you think there is something in neuroscience there's patterns tools in neuroscience that could help us uh, shed some light on ethics, or is yeah. it mostly on the psychologist or sociology much higher level? No, there is psychology, but there is also, in the meantime, there are um, there is evidence, fMRI, of a specific areas of the brain that are involved in certain ethical judgment. 
And not only this, you can stimulate those areas with magnetic fields and change the ethical decisions. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So that's a work by a colleague of mine, Rebecca Sachs, and there is a, other researchers doing similar work. And I think, you know, this is the beginning, but um, ideally at some point we'll have an understanding of how this works and why it evolved, right? Um, the big why question, yeah, it must have some, some purpose. Yeah, obviously it has, you know, some social purposes is uh, probably. If neuroscience holds the key to at least eliminate some aspect of ethics, that means it could be a learnable problem. Yeah, exactly. And as we're getting into harder and harder questions, let's go uh, to the hard <laughs> problem of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, is this an important problem for us to think about and solve on the engineering of intelligence side of your work, of our dream? You know, it's unclear. So, you know, again, this is uh, a, a deep problem, partly because it's very difficult to define consciousness and, uh, and there is a debate uh, among uh, neuroscientists and uh, about whether consciousness and philosophers, of course, whether consciousness is something that requires bl flesh and blood, so to speak, yeah, <laughs> or could be, you know, that we could have silicon devices that are conscious. Yes or up to statement like everything has some degree of consciousness and some more than others. Yeah. This is like uh, Giulio Tognoni and yeah. uh, Fee. Yeah. We just recently talked to Christoph Koch. Okay. So he, yeah, Christoph was my first graduate student. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you think it's important to illuminate aspects of consciousness in order to engineer intelligent systems? Do you think an intelligent system would ultimately have consciousness? Are they too, are they interlinked? You know, most of the people working in artificial intelligence, I think would answer, we don't strictly need consciousness to have an intelligent system. That's sort of the easier question because, yeah. because it's, it's a very engineering answer to the question. Yes. Pass the Turing test, we don't need consciousness. But if you were to go, do you think it's possible that we need to have so that kind of self-awareness? Uh, we may, yes. So for instance, I, I personally think that when uh, test a machine or a person in a Turing test, in an extended Turing test, you know, I think consciousness is part of what we require in that test you know, implicitly to say that this is intelligent. Christoph disagrees. So Yes, he does. Yeah. It, uh, <laughs> it, it, despite many other romantic notions he holds, <laughs> he disagrees with that one. Yes, uh, that's right. So, you know, we'll see. Do you think, as a quick question, Ernest Becker's fear of death, do you think mortality and those kinds of things are important for, well, for consciousness and for intelligence, the hmm. finiteness of life, finiteness of existence, or is that just a side effect of evol ev evolutionary side effect that's useful to uh, for natural selection? Do you think this kind of thing that we're gonna, this interview is gonna run out of time soon. Our life will run out of time soon. Do you think that's needed to make this conversation good and <laughs> and life good? You know, I never thought about it. It's a in, in, in very interesting question. I think uh, uh, Steve Jobs in his uh, commencement speech at Stanford argued that, you know, having a finite life was important for for stimulating achievements. So it was a different, yeah, live every day like it's your last, right? With yeah, them. yeah. So, I, uh, rationally, I don't think strictly you need mortality for consciousness, but 
Who knows? They seem to go together in our biological system, right? Yeah, yeah. You've mentioned uh, before, and students are associated with uh, AlphaGo mobilized the big recent success stories in AI. And I think it's captivated the entire world of what AI can do. So what do you think will be the next breakthrough? <laughs> and what's your intuition about the next breakthrough? Of course, I don't know where the next breakthrough is. I, I think that um, there is a good chance, as I said before, that the next breakthrough will also be inspired by, you know, neuroscience. Yes. But uh, which one, I don't know. And there's, so MIT has this quest for intelligence. Yeah. And there's a few moonshots, which in that spirit, which ones are you excited about? What, uh, which projects kind of... Uh... Well, of course, I'm excited about one of the moonshots, with it, which is our Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, yeah. which is the, the one which is fully, fully funded uh, by NSF. Um, and it's a, it, it is about visual intelligence. That's and that, very, that one is about, uh, particularly about understanding. Visual uh, intelligence, vi so visual the intelligence. visual cortex and, uh, and visual... And, uh, intelligence in the sense of how we look around ourselves and understand the world around ourselves, you know, meaning what what is going on, how we could um, go from here to there without hitting obstacles, um, you know, whether there are other agents, people in the environment. Th these are all things that we perceive very quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's something actually quite close to being conscious, not quite, but you know, there is this interesting experiment that was run at Google X, mm -hmm. um, which is in a sense is uh, just a, a, a virtual reality experiment, but in which they had a subject sitting, say in a chair with uh, goggles like Oculus and so on, mm -hmm. earphones, and they were seeing through the eyes of a robot nearby, two cameras, microphones for receiving. So their sensory system was there, right? And the impression of all the subject, very strong, they could not shake it off, was that they were where the robot was. They could look at themselves from the robot and still feel they were they were where the robot is. They were looking at their body. Their self were, had moved. So yeah. some aspect of seeing understanding has to have ability to place yourself, uh, have a self-awareness about your position in the world and yeah. what the world is. Right. So, yeah. So we may have to solve the hard problem of consciousness to solve it. <laughs> On the way, it's, yes. It's quite, it's quite, <laughs> quite, quite a moonshot. Right. So, right. You've been an advisor to some incredible minds, uh, including Demis Asabis, Christoph Koch, Amnon Shashwa, like you said, all went on to become seminal figures in their respective fields. From your own success as a researcher and from perspective as a mentor of these researchers, having guided them, in the way of advice, what does it take to be successful in science and engineering careers? whether you're talking to somebody in their teens, 20s, and 30s, what does that path look like? It's curiosity and having fun. And uh, I think it's important also having fun with other curious minds. It's the, the people you surround with too. So yeah. fun and curiosity. Is there... If we mentioned Steve Jobs, is there also an underlying ambition that's unique that you saw, or is it really does boil down to insatiable curiosity and fun? Well, of course, uh, you know, it's being co curious in a active and ambitious way, yes, and uh, um, definitely. But I think uh, sometime in, in uh, science, and there are friends of mine who are like this, um, you know, there are some of the scientists like to work by themselves. 
and kind of communicate uh, only when they complete their work or discover something. Um, I think I always found the the actual process of uh, you know discovering something is more fun if it's together with other intelligent and curious and fun people. So if you see the fun in that process, the side effect of that process would be that you'll actually end up discovering some interesting yeah, things. Yes. So as uh, you've led uh, uh, many incredible efforts here, what's the secret to being a good advisor, mentor, leader in a research setting? Is it oh, that, a similar spirit or yeah, what, what, what advice could you give to people, young faculty and so on? It's partly repeating what I said about an environment that should be friendly and fun and uh, ambitious. And, uh, you know, I, I think I learned a lot from some of my advisors and friends and some of our physicists. And uh, there was, for instance, this um, um, behavior that was encouraged of when somebody comes with a new idea in the group, you are, unless it's really stupid, but you are always enthusiastic. And then, and you're enthusiastic for a few minutes, for a few hours. Then you start, you know, asking critically a few questions, yeah. try, 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 like testing this. Yes. But, you know, this is a process that is, I think it's very, it's very good. This, you have to be enthusiastic. Sometimes people are very critical from the beginning. That's, that's, that's not, you have, to, you have to give it a chance to that, yes. that, that seed to grow. That yeah. said, so with some of your ideas, which are quite revolutionary, so there's I've, I witnessed, especially in the human vision side and neuroscience side, there could be some pretty heated arguments. Um, do you enjoy these? Is that a part of science and acad yeah. ac academic pursuits that you enjoy? Yeah. Is it? <laughs> is that something that happens in your group as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I also spent some time in Germany. Again, there is this tradition in which people are more uh, forthright, less kind than here. Yep. So, you know, in the US, you, you, when you write a bad letter, you still say, this guy is nice, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I here think, in America, it's degrees of nice. Uh, yes. Uh, it's, it's all just degrees of nice, yeah. Right, right. So, as long as this does not become personal, and it's really like, you know, a football game with its rules, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. So, so, if you somehow find yourself in a position to ask one question of an oracle, like mm. a genie, maybe a god, well, and you're guaranteed to get a clear answer. What kind of question would you ask? What what would be the question you would ask? In the spirit of our discussion, it could be how could be how could I become ten times more intelligent? <laughs> <laughs> and so, but see, you only get a clear short answer. So, do you think there's a clear short answer to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the answer you'll get. Okay. <laughs> So you've mentioned uh, Flowers of uh, Algernon. Oh, yeah. There's a, a story that inspired you in your, in your childhood. As this uh, story of a mouse, a human achieving genius level intelligence, and then understanding what was happening while slowly becoming not intelligent again, and this tragedy of gaining intelligence and losing intelligence. Do you think in that spirit, in that story, do you think intelligence is a gift or a curse from the perspective of happiness and meaning of life. So you, you try to create an intelligent system that understands the universe, but on an individual level, the meaning of life, do you think intelligence is a gift? It's a good question. I don't know. As one of the as one who people consider the smartest people in the world <laughs> in some in some dimension at the very least uh what do you think i don't know it may be invariant to intelligence let a degree of happiness it would be nice if it were 
That's the hope. Yeah. You could be smart and happy and clueless and happy. Yeah. As always, on the discussion of the meaning of life is probably a good place to end. Tommaso, thank you so much for talking today. Thank you. This was great.